many instances of corruption actually happen because we really don't have a choice and being rule following in these sorts of situations really don't help. Then there's the other case where much larger organizations of which there are very few in developing countries, whether in Nigeria or indeed in India, where I am currently, though I'm pretty much based uh, in the UK and, and do my research in Nigeria. In many cases, these kind of large organizations of which there are few, as I said, are politically extremely powerful. Uh, and they're therefore, you know, too powerful to be subject to any kind of formal rule of enforcement. They will uh, not enforce laws because it, it's not in their interest. They can distort laws, they can make laws uh, as and how they wish in, in many cases. So as you, as you can see, when we set it up, rule following actually really doesn't happen in the way that standard anti-corruption thinks it should happen, that everybody really follows, only a, a marginal few really break the rules. So any anti-corruption intervention has to treat those people at the margin. But we said that's not true. Most of us, whether we want to follow rules or not, have to infringe rules at some point or the other. That makes anti-corruption extremely difficult. So we've actually set ourselves up a very, very challenging task of researching evidence that anti-corruption can work in such a context where actually rule following doesn't happen across the board, where it's, it's rule following is actually not the norm, right? So effective rule following will only emerge when a majority of society will want to enforce rules in their own interest. And most developing countries, developing countries are really uh, not there yet. Now that doesn't mean developed countries don't have a similar problem, but the scale and magnitude and the outcome is, is much lower on a relative scale than with the average developing country. So the program takes this insights and operates on one common principle, that top-down technical approaches to corruption have often produced very discouraging results. It also moves from a sort of standard paradigm of anti-corruption research that rests simply on unearthing corruption in the hope that the information about that corruption will somehow make the problem disappear. But most of us, uh, whether on the panel or sitting in the audience, really know the corruption that's taking place, but have very little levers in terms of how to tackle it and how to enforce rules. So information is really not the problem. So again, that's a significant difference that we see in our approach to corruption from the standard uh, sort of anti-corruption approach. So driving our research is this understanding that to be effective in such adverse contexts, we need to identify anti-corruption interventions that have a developmental effect that actually raise productive outcomes that actually provides better service delivery. So absenteeism in the healthcare sector should go down or electricity should be increased. Electricity supply should be increased at optimum and, and affordable tariff rates. For us, that's a developmental outcome. And that's, that's when anti-corruption has succeeded, right? So, so when anti-corruption inter interventions have a developmental effect and when enforcement, is in my interest and your interest and the community's interest. And that's when all of us come together to actually uphold the laws. And we are also monitoring others now at the margins who are not upholding the law in that particular sector. That's when anti-corruption interventions are possible. And that's the kind of research that we actually do at SOAS. So you might think it's difficult that we actually find evidence of many such possibilities across important sectors, like our work that we are doing with CDD now on the power sector on which we had a very robust and animated discussion really uh, just last week on, on corruption in and electricity sector reforms in Nigeria. But we also identify important areas where the evidence suggests that there is no feasible anti-corruption solution at the moment, but the social costs in terms of health or environment are also very high. And therefore anti-corruption should focus on mitigating those human and environmental costs. And indeed the work that SOAS ACE is doing in the Niger Delta currently reflects this kind of an approach. So to put it another way, our framework states that anti-corruption is more likely when actors are interested in upholding the law, have the power to monitor their peers, and can take them to task if they're violating rules. That, that's really the kind of, sounds simple, it's, it's not always very easy to find it, we have to drill down very deep, we have to have intensive understanding of our sectors of how the corruption works and what anti-corruption will work in terms of the evidence that we provide. Because one of the most common causes for corruption is the enforcement deficit, as we call it, because even where robustly defined rules exist, their enforcement can leave much to be desired. So what happens when this, and this adverse context is being discussed with reference to one of Africa's and perhaps even the developing world's most well-recognized, one of most well-recognized anti-corruption agencies, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission of Nigeria, after all, what is an anti-corruption agency, but one that's meant to enforce 
and effectively reduce corruption. Now, the EFCC has been an activist anti-corruption agency. It's also been controversial. In this context, how effective has been has the EFCC been in its fight against corruption? You know, what can we use as determinants of the EFCC's uh, effectiveness? Volume of prosecutions, volume of prosecutions culminating in convictions, value of assets or the amount of money recovered, you know, the implementation of the BVN uh, bank verification number and the treasury single account, these have all been known as successes, considered successes for the EFCC. It has made some uh, high profile prosecutions and convictions too, but there seems to be consensus across a broad spectrum that political interference and procedural ambiguity have blunted its operational effectiveness in recent times. You know, some of our research on the agency led by one of our panelists, Amelia Onyema, actually asks if mission creep has led to the agency becoming a tool of recovery for civil debt. You know, this is a somewhat questionable use of the FCC's capabilities. Forthcoming work by Idayat Hassan, who's the director of CDD, interrogates what the parallel existence of both the EFCC and ICPC means for anti-corruption uh, efforts in Nigeria. So you can see we've done some, 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 uh, some thought has gone into this in constructing the seminar and also in researching uh, the FCC and taking further the anti-corruption agenda in Nigeria. Uh, the other reasons, of course, that we won't focus on today in terms of what holds the FCC back, and we completely understand that, include operational inefficiency caused by inefficient funding or lack of technical capacity. But we also do understand that the unique political economy of the FCC, because it's so ingrained within the state and governance capacities, makes it a difficult organization uh, uh, to study. There, there is a question of political interference. And that's what we hope our, our absolutely wonderful panelists will, will be able to unpack today. So I'm, I'm going to begin with introducing uh, Juliet Ibeka Wagbu. Her career has had a focus on international asset recovery and management. And I'm going to read this very carefully because I don't want to get my details wrong on the panelists. Now, Juliet's career has had a focus on international asset recovery and management, as well as the use of recovered assets for sustainable development. She has worked extensively in the anti-corruption sector in Nigeria and internationally currently. She's a special assistant to the president on justice sector reform, international relations in the office of the attorney general of the federation and the Ministry of Justice. So, so you can see why she's set up to be uh, such a relevant panelist. She's previously been the pioneer national coordinator for the Open Government Partnership Support Unit. She's been the immediate past director of the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, a unit which really came out of the, of the FCC in one sense. Uh, she's also been assistant director of international cooperation of the FCC. So she's gonna bring her very relevant uh, experience to, to the panel and the discussion today. Our second panelist is Dawan Musa Rafsanjani. He is the executive director of the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, Advocacy Center, CISLAC. And most of us in Nigeria and even, even in Africa know uh, how important a civil society body CISLAC is. He is also the head of Transparency International Nigeria. And he's on the board of trustees um, uh, and chairman of Amnesty International. Uh, Awal Musa is one of the foremost voices in Nigerian civil society championing the causes of freedom of expression and, and citizens' rights, which actually dovetails well with some of uh, the aims and agendas of the FCC. So again, his experience is going to be very, very worthwhile. Professor Emilia Onyema is, is a colleague because I uh, also work at the University of London. Professor Emilia Onyema is a professor in international commercial law at SOAS. She's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, qualified to practice law in Nigeria and as a solicitor in England and Wales. She sits as an independent arbit arbitrator and has experience as sole presiding and co-arbitrator. She is a member of the Court of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce International Arbitra Arbitration Center. She therefore has deep knowledge of the judicial system in Nigeria and has brought these rich insights to the EFCC research project of SOAS ACE as a principal investigator. Two very quick words about myself. Uh, my name is Pallavi Roy. Uh, I head up uh, the research uh, of uh, the Nigeria aspect of SOAS's, and I teach international economics uh, at SOAS University of London. But I'm going to keep quiet here because I think our panelists have a lot to add to this conversation. Juliet, if I may, welcome you to, uh, yeah. sorry, Emilia. Uh, 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 Juliet, we will get to you in the second round. Emilia, if I may, uh, if you could open uh, with your thoughts and comments on this. Palavi, thank you so very much. And good morning, everybody. Uh, good day, wherever, if you're not within the West Africa time 
or the British summertime. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us for this discussion. Um, Pallavi's asked me to set out uh, what the SOAS is research on the EFCC and its effectiveness, the way we've gone about it and what we've done so far. Uh, I thought that I should uh, put in the chat the, the web link to where you will find the working papers that we've published. Everything on the ACE is, is online, is available. I would highly recommend, I'm going to speak to just quickly summarize this, but you know, if you're looking for something to lie on the beach in Lagos or somewhere uh, and read, uh, please uh, look at our working paper. We've written two working papers. One was in November, 2018, where we examined the EFCC, what it is, its remit, its wide mandate, and its effectiveness. And then in 2019, November, we published the second working paper on which we then uh, examined the, um, so, so Pallavi has talked about political capture, which we looked at in the first paper. But in the second working paper, we focused more on the use by, uh, by the private sector and high net worth individuals of the EFCC as a debt recovery agency. And we sort of looked and, and tried to unpack that to answer the question, if that is the EFCC going outside of its remit and then using its scarce resources for a bit of the project that is really not its core mandate. So what I wanted to pick up on is I think it's important to uh, remind us that it's at the end of the day, it's a research project, a funded research project. That's what the ACE, the Anti-Corruption Evidence uh, Research Project is about. And it's based on, a, uh, it has a theory, a theory of change, which was um, devised by one of our professors here, uh, the main guy who works on, on ACE, Mushtaq Khan. And one of the things he says, and all of this again, you'd find on the website, but I think it's important. Uh, and I'll try to unpack, I'll just read something to you that he says, which sounds really, really academic. And then I'll try to sort of break it down so that we can have a good discussion. He says that anti-corruption policies can be feasible if enforcement rules enable actors to use sustainable business models and operate productively. Sustainable business models, everybody within that sector is doing that and um, to operate productively because of course businesses are in business to make profit. That's one of the major theories and we know that they, they have bills to pay. And so if I want to just sort of really break all of that down, one of the things we all know and we have found out empirically by research is that what you have in the vast majority of developing countries as it rela relates to corruption and we have Juliet who would um, unpack some of this for us, is the idea of um, abiding by rules but it is not a question of abiding by rule of law, but um, rule by law. And so we have various uh, legislations, we have uh, the decisions of the courts, we have loads on paper, but then we circumvent all of that and we just sort of check things off. So we are not led by, we're not a rules abiding community of persons. I think that is uh, the starting point and that is critical. And this is not only in Nigeria, but, but uh, Mushtaq's research is shown that the vast majority of developing countries, that's where they are because of the informality, uh, inf informalities mm -hmm. of various sectors that we have. And so, in addition to the informalities of the sectors, I, I would want to also suggest that uh, we need to think of our cultural background uh, and the fluidities of relationships. And the fact that we, quite a number of so-called businesses are not um, 
very well educated, let me put it that way, for want of a better expression, very well ed ed educated. And so, and what I mean by that is ensuring that the law is effective. And if it is effective, we all abide by it. The essence of the theory of change that Mushtaq talks about is let's just take the legal profession, for example, and let's take the billing of clients. If I, as Amelia, uh, do some work uh, and the Nigerian Bar Association or whoever deals with billing has said, okay, you bill 10 Naira per hour for your uh, year of call and the nature of work that you're doing. And Juliet has done the same work. And then Juliet is billing 1,000 Naira per hour because she knows all the high net worth individuals who are happy to pay that. Uh, that would distort the market. And if we don't have enough people, enough pool of people who are willing to obey what the Nigerian Bar Association or whoever has said that is the way we should bill, then you can see that it would aid, um, if, we, if you like, corruption or lack of obedience. Uh, and so what you would find is that we would have, um, yes, we do have a rules-based system because it says you need to charge one 10 Naira per hour for this type of work and for your year of call. But are we rules obeying? No, we're not. And so one of the things that ACE has done is ACE is looking at different sectors. And the primary idea is that if we have enough people obeying the rules and have enough clout, the, 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 the system itself would force the others to become rules obeying or, or rules abiding or following because transactional cost will be higher for them when they do not obey the rules. And it is, it, it's, it's a little bit technical, but if you just sort of step back and think about it and think of the example I have given, then you might, be, you might begin to understand the, the theory behind the work we're doing with ACE. And so to quickly come down to EFCC, what we did with EFCC. What we did with the EFCC is we, in, so you would, we, we've gone into the basics and all of that. And then we said, come, how do we measure the effectiveness of the EFCC, recognizing that a complete um, removal or, yeah, removal of, of corruption, uh, it's near impossible in, in any community, in any community, including where Palavia and myself work. You know, it is near impossible. All you need to do is read what's going on with the contracts they gave thanks to COVID. And then you will realize that uh, corruption is not a black thing or a Nigerian thing. And, and so, so it's, that's not, that would be too high. And that's not what the EFCC is being set up to do. But how can the EFCC reduce the incidence of high level corruption and that's one of the things, uh, that's primarily what we looked at. We recognize that the mandate of the EFCC is really wide, but we decided to focus only on, um, uh, where am I now? We decided to focus only on how many successful prosecutions the EFCC has managed um, to, 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 to have or, 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 or that we can, focus on. One of the difficulties uh, we've had with the research is, of course, data, finding data. And that goes to part of our recommendations in the paper. And the best source of data, ideally, should be the EFCC itself and the EFCC website. We did some interviews with some judges and some lawyers who work in this field. Yesterday, in preparation for this, I looked at the EFCC website and they've sort of updated their operational statistics is on their website you can easily find that so we looked at 2010 to 2015 the data that we used but they've updated it to 2019 and so i'm just going to take only 2019 so in 2019 the efcc had 
12,644 petitions that they received. And they investigated 8,729. We don't know why they did not investigate the, um, the others. Out of that, they filed 1,901 in court and they secured 1,280 convictions of the 1,901 matters that they had in court. And so, so now this 1,280 started from 12,644. I think we need to bear that in mind. And so one of the things for us, uh, we said, well, after doing the research with the constraints that um, they, we identified three major constraints to the effectiveness of the EFCC and Palavi, I would stop after this. And we, that's political capture. And it, it, on that political capture, we talked about uh, the, whichever government is in power using the EFCC to do their bidding, to fight their political battles and things like that. And then the inability of the EFCC to prosecute uh, politically exposed persons. And then we talked about organizational deficiencies, the difficulties EFCC has, they themselves recognize things like training. But we must also recognize the type of people that are appointed in the EFCC. Uh, quite a number of them, over 50% are for our police officers. And we all know, we're Nigerians, we know that, uh, and this we also found out, and there's research to, 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 to this effect, that the Nigerian police force is one of the most corrupt uh, institutions in, in Nigeria. And then you, you take people from, 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 from the Nigerian police force to staff the, the, the EFCC. And then the other thing with, with their uh, organizational deficiencies, the normal thing that any institution will talk about is funding, but training and collaboration with international, uh, other international agencies like Interpol and all of that. Then the third thing we picked up on is the judicial process, which in my personal opinion is outside of the control of the EFCC. So, so we all know that our judicial system, not just the process, is no longer fit for purpose. It is, it is very colonial. It is absolutely not fit for purpose, no matter how you look at it. And so things like there are various ways the lawyers can manipulate the, the litigation process and the judicial process. The Nigerian judiciary uh, is the third most corrupt institution in, in, in the country. I mean, this is not from our own research. This is from an independent research of the UNDP and the Nigerian uh, Bureau of Statistics. And so, so, so you have those and um, the delays and the cost of the process itself feeds into the, the, um, the, the frustration of, of the EFCC. And the lack of qualified personnel that, that bring actions on behalf of the EFCC goes again towards all of these no case submissions and inability to prove their case. And, and the data that I've just read to you, 12,644 petitions received, and you secure convictions of 1,280, the vast majority of which are small and medium-sized disputes that really should not be uh, taken up by the EFCC. And the last thing I would leave you with and hand over to Palavi, she's already staring at me with her beady eyes, so I know that I'm running out of time, is that on the EFCC website, they also have uh, a list of high profile oil so, you know, prosecutions by the EFCC, where they've listed a total of 43, what they consider to be high profile uh, cases uh, without, uh, to, to just put you on notice, quite a number of the governors and former ministers are not on the list, but anyway, uh, they have those um, listed and where those uh, matters are. 
So I will stop there because I'll come back and pick up on some of this and we'll pick up on some of this during the Q&A. Vlad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amelia, for, for setting that up for us. Julia, over to you. You, you have the enviable job and, and I think we really enjoy listening to how you react to whatever has been set out here and bring in your vast experience in, in this field. Over to you, Julia. Okay. Thank you, Pallavi, and thank you, Professor. That was a very, um, I would say, very insightful discussion. Um, let me also say uh, that uh, I've just taken my time to read uh, through the uh, research, the ACE research, actually now to 2018, 2019, as well as the recent um, uh, writer by Hassan uh, Idayat. And I think um, from where I see it, I, I can see a um, lot of progress from when EFCC was set up in 2004. Um, with the mandate to investigate uh, financial, economic and financial crimes, to prosecute uh, economic and financial crime, to ensure prevention as well. And then of course, to ensure that the public becomes aware of the negative effect of uh, economic and financial crime. So where, where, where I want to start from is from the legal framework establishing uh, the EFCC, which sets out the powers. And the powers are quite extensive. When you look at section six of EFCC, it gives you a rundown of all the powers that the EFCC has, as well as special powers under section seven. And so when I look at this, I just want to, first of all, I'm sure we're coming through this process. I want to just look at what have we implemented within the framework that exists today what do we need to implement? And then of course, when we come back, we can talk about challenges and then what the reforms we want to talk about. So that's the way I'm going to unpack my own uh, uh, introduction to this discussion. So first of all, uh, the legal mandate gives EFCC all the powers. In fact, sometimes uh, we talk about extensive powers. As you know, EFCC used to be the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit as well. Uh, which meant that it has powers to investigate, to prosecute, to gather intelligence, to undertake prevention measures, to coordinate, uh, to collaborate with other agencies, both locally and internationally. It also has powers to then seek for future of assets. And so within this mandate, and one can rightly say, even compare it with so many other anti-corruption agencies in Africa and beyond, that even within the US, um, the United States Department of Justice may not even have as much power as the FCC has. And so the, the thing is that there is a legal mandate to do those things that have been set out. Now, when we look at that uh, mandate within the framework, of the Nigerian anti-corruption system, something that you also alluded to. You find that EFCC is just one of the anti-corruption agencies today in Nigeria, uh, working side by side with the Independent Corrupt Practices and other related <clears throat> offenses commission. And, and what that means is that there is, of course, always uh, um, the rivalry, the tough war about who should do what. Uh, but when I look at the mandate, I find that there are very clear framework established for economic and financial crime. Now, some of those economic crimes could then cut into public sector corruption, uh, depending on how you define it. And, and you can really, <clears throat> again, when you look at the powers, you can see that you can define broadly the mandates uh, uh, or the powers given to EFCC. Now, when, when you look at the powers of ICPC in relation to the EFCC, it, in fact, it's limited. And therefore, um, one would then expect that more is expected of EFCC because of these wide ranging powers. Um, I think that when we begin to look at uh, the issues, when I, when I look at the informal rules and the formal rules, uh, mentioned by Professor Emilia, we then begin to look at the institutional mechanisms. So we have the law. What about the institutional mechanisms? Are there formal rules? Are there informal rules? And how do we apply those rules? So the, the law itself has also given the EFCC the mandate to set out regulation, first of all, policies, 
and staff regulations. The staff regulations that would guide how EFCC's operations are conducted on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is different from the appointment and the removal procedure, which is entirely something, if you like, exogenous from EFCC because that is not their mandate. Their mandate is to ensure that the staff comply with the rules set within the mandate of the EFCC. And I would like to make that distinction. The, the appointment process of the chairman or the secretary and the other board members are certainly different. Something that the president can only comply with based on when the, the Senate actually confirms those appointments and the issue of removal of those top people. Now, when we look at the number of the, the people at the top level, we're just talking about the chairman, the secretary, and probably three or four, four other persons who are appointed. But then we have almost 4,000 staff that we need to make sure they understand what they are doing in EFCC. And I think uh, when we focus on this, we may be able to begin to say, okay, what do we need to do to make sure that all these people understand what their roles are? And again, the, the act gives the power for training, training, continuous training, so that those continuous training can guide <clears throat> what staff are supposed to do. And going back to 2004, when EFCC was set up, the, the EFCC Training Institute was set up for this particular purpose, which is to ensure that EFCC begins to develop internal skills to, to make sure that its mandates are taken care of. So that, that talks about the issue of the internal procedure, something that is, again, for me, is indigenous and needs to be addressed internally. And so we must make this distinction between the internal mandate, something that has to be done internally and something that is required externally. And that takes me to the issue of prosecution. So what should be prosecuted and what should not be prosecuted? Uh, the, the, the EFCC Act also gives the EFCC the power to prosecute. Of course, this is subject to the power of the Attorney General. But there's already a, if you like, a card blush. There is this open mandate to prosecute and nobody is actually restricting that power to prosecute. And what that means is that EFCC can prosecute cases that come before it after investigation. So the question is, have the investigation been done properly? Do you have enough evidence to proceed to the next level? Or are you going to prosecute just for the sake of it? These questions are fundamental when we want to look at the mandate of the courts, because the court can only rule on what is before it. So when we look at the number of prosecution, number of conviction, investigated cases, I will move it to the court system. The court cannot but give decision based on the facts before it. And this is really very critical because we've had this debate in Nigeria about why, why the delay, the issue of delay, actually we've tried to deal with the issue of delay under the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, going back to 2015. And then the act has also indicated that the court can move faster when it comes to these types of cases. But then what if the courts cannot move faster because the fact before it and the presentation of those cases are not moving in the direction that the court would want it to move. Of course, I'm not saying that there are not issues that we need to deal with at the judicial level. I'm just saying that there are also factors that we need to look at beyond what the judiciary should do and can do within its own powers. So today the courts have practice directions requiring it to make sure that corruption cases move faster and within a certain timeline. I think for me today, the question is, are the courts sticking to those rules? Are there reasons why, and I hope people can come into this discussion, are there reasons why we still think that the courts or the judicial process uh, is not working the way it should work? Is that something that has to do with the courts or is it something that ha has to do with the agency that is prosecuting those cases? And this, uh, and by the way, is this something that has to do with the bar? What about the lawyers that go before the court and they want several adjournments over and over again and actually go all the way 
uh, to protect their clients, to make sure that the cases do not move forward. And so those are factors that we need to look at. Then the other element it now goes back to the issue of communication with the public. How do we make sure that we prevent these crimes before they happen? I, I've had the discussion about the, the Treasury single account, the BVN, all this was set up as part of the prevention mechanisms to prevent economic crimes within the public sector, to prevent financial crime within the financial institutions. So they're supposed, these are tools that can help. But, but beyond these tools, are they helping? Because um, it seems to me we are still, every day we report cases of huge economic crimes occurring every day in Nigeria. Are we able to use these tools to prevent them? So what are the problems? Why are we still struggling to prevent financial crimes, the occurrence of um, you know, exorbitant amount of money that still get lost in the financial system? So what again is the problem? So we, are, we can discuss all of this when we get to challenges. The one thing I've found is that sometimes the public do not understand what the role of EFCC is, which is where we begin to see um, the um, submission of petitions that may not necessarily go to EFCC when we talk about debt recovery, using EFCC as debt recovery. And so when we, when we lose sight of what the core responsibilities are, it becomes the role of the institution to make sure those, those petitions do not come to EFCC. And when it does come, it should be channeled to where it should go to, and that's where collaboration and coordination comes in. I know we talked a little bit about the role of the police in EFCC. I know that today the, the, that particular issue is being dealt with through the uh, appointment of somebody who is a core staff of EFCC. And, and let me explain this a little bit, something that um, coming from where I'm working today, and the attorney general has tried to push this particular instrument, or if you like an administrative procedure when EFCC was set up because EFCC needed the police to establish uh, the institution, it became necessary to bring in the police at that time. And the law said that you can send people on secondment for the first two years and maybe another two years. However, what we saw was that from four years we now have a situation where the police were there up till uh, 2019, I believe. That is going to almost 16 years. Now, the law has also given the mandate for people who have investigative security background uh, to become the chairman of EFCC. So what we did was to look at section 126, 2C, and say, okay, if somebody, no, not, or section one to B. If somebody who has been in EFCC for 15 years has the capacity to investigate and prosecute, why shouldn't that person who is who was hired as a staff of EFCC lead EFCC? By the way, going back to 2005 when Ribadu was there, uh, there was already an understanding that the police will exit at some point in time. And there was also an understanding that the staff who were hired as investigators from 2005, these were young uh, men and women who were hired as core investigators should take over the, the leadership of EFCC over time. So that has now been implemented with the, the recent appointment of, of a core staff of EFCC. We'll now have to wait and see how that unfolds because we need to then over, over time see whether the core staff are able to take that mandate and move it forward. So we need to give them some time and see how things uh, proceed. But that's one of the innovations that have been put forward uh, recently. Um, the other thing I could touch on uh, very quickly is on the issue of asset recovery and management and forfeiture proceedings. The law is very clear that the court procedure should be the framework for um, for future of assets. So there is an interim process and the final process. Again, I'm sure people would allude to challenges in terms of actually where those assets sit once the court has given an interim order. We do know that there are challenges which we could talk about, but what has then happened in the past um, since 2019 is that we now also have a regulation on asset 
management, uh, which is essentially being managed by the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation. So there is an asset management unit. And the essence of this asset management unit is that there should be a procedure where once the final order is given, those assets are identified and there is a process to manage them. And of course, the court could also be requested under the Administration of Criminal Justice Act to give an order for the sale of those assets instead of allowing it to uh, waste away, to give an order so that those assets can be sold. But in order to put the required checks in place, the Office of Attorney General is now also required under the regulation to work with EFCC and other anti-corruption agencies to ensure that those assets are disposed of pending a final forfeiture. And in the absence of a final forfeiture, if it's taking too long and you cannot sell because the court has not given an order, then there has to be a procedure for management. Unfortunately, like you know, pointed out by Professor Emilia and other researchers in the report uh, of 2018 and 20, I believe 2019, we have also seen that those the, the process of crime bill, which is of course still um, in the National Assembly, is something that is required in order to advance Nigeria's particular, you know, the, the, what I'll call the peculiarity of the Nigerian system when it comes to moving uh, from as interim asset orders to final forfeiture orders and ensuring the accountability of these assets. And so what the government has done going back to 2017 is to include in the national budget an item for um, recovered assets so that when there is a revenue generated from recovered assets, that revenue becomes an item under the budgetary framework from year to year. And so we can say, okay, if 200 billion is recovered today, it has to go into the budgetary allocation as part of, that is, that is a domestic asset, by the way. It goes straight into the domestic um, into the budgetary allocation or annual budgetary allocation. Uh, and what this has done is that people can see the line item clearly and know where that money is going into. For the international assets, this is dealt differently because then because we're working with other countries and we have to work within the UN Convention uh, Against Corruption procedures, it means that countries can determine working closely with Nigeria where those assets can go to. But of course, that is also subject to the approval uh, by the Nigeria Federal Executive Council. So what we have done in recent time with recovered internationally recovered assets is that we have begun to invest it in social welfare. We've, we are now investing in infrastructure. And, and those things are on the website of the Federal Ministry of Justice, justice.gov.ng, where we are trying to make sure that people know where the funds are going to. Civil societies are invited to monitor where those assets are going to. But I think this is where we have been able, we've succeeded in doing this is in the international, but we need to look at it from the angle of the, why, why can't we do the same with the domestic assets recovery? And so it's critical that um, those issues come out maybe during this discussion and what we do with the outcome of these discussions. I think, let me stop here briefly, and then I'll come back to the issue of challenges. I know somebody is saying we need to talk about the challenges, definitely. So we will discuss it, but I think I can stop here and allow others to speak. Thank you very much, Balavi. Thank you so much, Julie. It's fascinating, and, and you know, we can see why we're going to have a really good, good conversation. I'm looking forward to the exchange between Emilia and you and Mr. Rafsanjani when he comes in. Unfortunately, he's been having a few technical issues. So I think what we will do is uh, you know, bring up some very interesting points that, that you made, Julia. The fact is, you know, the EFCC has the framework. It, it's given a wide range of powers. I think what we are discussing is how effectively have those been used and more fundamentally, are they being allowed to use those, those yeah. powers? I think that is a very fundamental question that we, we need to answer. It's, it's that you know, developing country phenomenon, as Amelia said, it's a, it's a colonial phenomenon. All of us have been led with a sort of left with certain Anglo-Saxon frameworks of law and rule of law, which are really not uh, uh, the, cor the correct framework to be used in political contexts like ours across developing mm -hmm. countries. So then we have a normative benchmark 
that we all want to aim towards, our rules aren't set up to, to, to being implementable within, within what can actually be implemented. So we, we do have this implementation deficit and the FCC also suffers from it, like, like do anti-corruption agencies across developing economies. How do we A, match that gap and B, within that problem, that mismatch that we have, how do we make it more, more effective? I think that, that is at the heart of what we are trying to research. Then you talked about, uh, you know, the judiciary can only rule on the evidence that they have. That's absolutely true. And, you know, some of the, uh, it's been raised in, in, I think the earlier working paper, right, Emilia, the 2018 one? Yeah. These delays. Yes, exactly. That these delays are a very good way of kicking it in the long grass. We, it's just gone there and, well, we don't have dates. Now, what do we do? Nothing gets hap Nothing happens, no prosecutions. Prevention, that is something that uh, it, when Mr. Rafsanjani joins, it's something that uh, we would love to talk about. Prevention requires changing of incentives. If I don't have the incentive to use the EFCC correctly, and that's, I think, the second paper that perhaps Emilia will also talk about. If I don't have the incentive to not use the EFCC as a debt recovery mechanism, if I don't have fast track ports, if my ports take too long to even, you know, adjudicate on a civil uh, financial uh, sort of uh, problem, then I will use the EFCC. So there are these little bottlenecks that we also need to get around. Prevention will happen when I want to prevent it or all of us want to prevent it. So, so, and then of course your final point about the assets, uh, how is asset repatriation taking place? What, and you said, you know, there is budgetary allocation and it, it is under a budget line. How do I know where it's been spent? Do I have that live transparency? And I know there are lots of civil society organizations, you know, budget, et cetera, you know, OGP has done work on it. We're trying to look at, and because this is very important for Nigeria, asset recovery and the use of that asset for sustainable development. So you touched on some really, really uh, sort of uh, relevant pulse points there. And uh, Emilia, I don't know whether you want to come in here or maybe uh, I think there have been quite a few questions here. Can, I, uh, can yeah. I come in while you're picking which question? Absolutely, for, absolutely. For Go ahead, Emilia. Uh, and to thank Juliet, we didn't expect anything less. And mm -hmm. thank you for the way you have you have set that out as as Palavi has summarized. I think one of the things uh, we need to think about as a community is this whole question of actually two questions: Are we fighting corruption the right way? Are we using the right tool? Because we, as we said in our, our first paper. There are different ways uh, different countries have tried to fight corruption. Um, so, so again, is it possible for us to organically, organically knowing our context, knowing where we are at, can we organically figure out whether we're using the right tool? And then the, the second thing that we do need to really, really unpack is uh, and something that Juliet had talked about. And, and, uh, and I'm going to say something funny. There's something, there's an agency of government called National Orientation Agency. And I keep asking everybody I know, what does National Orientation Agency, what exactly do they do? Nobody knows. But my suggestion is that uh, ideally, they should be the ones uh, picking up on cultural sensitivities, social sensitivities, uh, uh, education on, on uh, civics uh, and civility and all of that, which should help with, with prevention. I think one of the other angles of prevention would then be a question of how do we claw back? So somebody had said something in the chat and uh, the person talked about how you know ethics and expectations of the society. In, in my view, the society itself is corrupt. The society itself is corrupt. But the irony of the corruption is that the vast majority of the citizenry do not think that they are corrupt. So if I give you an example of, let's take the probate division. And this happened to somebody I know very uh, recently. 
uh, you take the probate um, division and you're going to get uh, sort of sort out your probate so you can access a fund to pay your children's school fees and all of that. And it is ridiculous, the deliberate obstacles that the law itself has put in place in the guise of trying to ensure that it is the right person who should apply for probate and who should gain access that actually gains access to those funds. And then the length, the time it takes. And so, so the person, all those staff, the typists in that probate office doesn't think that they're being corrupt when they insist that you need to show up, you need to stand there, you need to bring money for this, you need to bring money for that, you need to say thank you. And that is a huge problem. And so how does the society itself define corruption and is the society itself willing as a society to move away from, you know, yeah, for, from their own way of, of conducting uh, transactions, move away from the present system and actually do things the right way. So, so those are two major points. Uh, Pallavi, I think you're, you're ready, yeah? I indeed am. Okay, excellent. Excellent uh, points made by Emilia in, in terms of responding to what Juliet says. I think uh, we've got some very interesting audience engagement going here. So what I will do is I'll pick up a question and uh, Emilia or, and or Juliet, feel free to uh, answer them. Lukman, he says, is it time to give urgent sufficient attention to anti-corruption prevention strategy? This is something that Juliet was talking about as well as Emilia also picked up. No anti-corruption can uh, work effectively in, in societies where values and ethics are presently low. CSOs must therefore up the game. Uh, that's one question that Lukman has. Would any of you, uh, who would like to take this question at this point? This is a huge question, prevention. We've all, all talked about it, but really how feasible is prevention? Or let me flip it to both of you. I'm, I'm just going to reframe Lukman's question a little bit. It's not just about how feasible is, is prevention, what kind of prevention can we feasibly do? It's not about prevention being a whole doll umbrella term, but there are bits and pieces of prevention that we could possibly feasibly do, a kind of you know, triaging, if you, if you wish, that we do in medical terms, whether we could do it in legal terms. Yeah. What would that be? What could that look like? Well, let me, of, yeah. you know, Go I ahead, can Julie. pick up from that, yeah. because the thing is that uh, prevention measures are already inbuilt within the system, and I am aware that you know one of the uh, ICPC has uh, been criticised for uh, doing more of prevention work than enforcement, right? And if you go back to all the work they have been done, it's essentially trying to work with the young people, work with the media, work with civil society organisations, uh, work in the schools, and the rest of them, and Nigerians. And I, I'm sure most of the people in this, uh, in this uh, particular uh, pa uh, session would uh, allude to the fact that uh, people have criticized ICBC for too much work on prevention. So that is not to say that there are no prevention mechanisms or work going on because there are attempts to just get the young people to begin to understand what corruption is all about. We have today a national policy on ethics, which, in my view, has not been widely disseminated. So it's one thing to have these ethical procedures in place and another thing to make it work. As a matter of fact, in one of the work that ICP has, ICPC has done is what we call the anti-corruption unit in all the federal ministries, units and parastatas. And, and the whole idea is that there will be a desk officer whose responsibility is to report back to ICPC on anything that is happening. It's one of the tools that were set out to make sure that people understand what their roles in ICPC is. But the problem is the way that people are actually implementing that. So moving from what the law or the practice is and what people are re ready to imbibe as part of the culture of reform and part of a way to admit, okay, yeah, we've gone wrong here, 
we need to begin to do the right thing is completely missing. And so that is just a, an ecosystem in which we operate. And I agree with uh, Professor Amelia that there, something needs to be done about it. We need to talk to ourselves. We need to begin to say, where have things gone wrong? And it will require a systemic review of the processes of, of both the public and private sector framework, the way we engage, not just in the public sector, because it's always wrong to think that corruption is just a public sector thing. It is not. Without collusion with the private sector, some of the things we are seeing today will not happen. So take, for example, the banks where monies are moving from day to day. And there are measures within our anti-money laundering framework that says, when, if you see so, so, so amount of money, you need to report it quickly to the FIU. I saw that somebody asked the question about the relationship between the two. So the FIU would get those reports as um, suspicious transaction reports and should immediately send it to law enforcement. The banks can also automatically report to the EFCC who should then do a quick check and stop the money from moving. So that relationship exists. But in a country of 200 million people, how we assess the effectiveness of these measures and whether we have adequate manpower to deal with this, the level at which it happens is something that we also need, that, need to look at. So from day to day, the amount of money that is moving around in Nigeria is so huge that it, you begin to wonder, do we, can we actually monitor that that's the essence of data and that's the essence of machine tools. And so maybe we need to begin to look at innovative ways of doing what is how, how dealing with the problems we have today. Because I, I do not think that one agency is enough to deal with this. But at the same time, we're not talking about creating new agencies. We're talking about enabling the, these institutions to use innovative tools to look at what is happening and begin to uh, stop them. So as part of that prevention measures, we talked about the TSA, the Treasury Single Account. If, if the enforcement agencies with the FIU just monitor on a daily basis where public funds are going to and are able to say, okay, yeah, these funds are not going where to go, it should go to the other place, then maybe it can narrow down uh, the amount of money that's get to where it should not go to. So these are, again, things that we need to look at the issue of monitoring, because sometimes we look at these things as soft tools, but then we need to use both the soft and the hard tool, the enforcement measures, because just looking at prosecution, I, 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 from seriously, personally, I think prosecution has not worked in Nigeria. So why don't we look at other ways to uh, deal with this problem? Thank you. Can I can I come in there? Thank you very very much, Juliet, for 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 for. for Amelia, two to three minutes, and then we'll take another question. Absolutely. Yes, please. But I just wanted to quickly. Uh, I agree with everything Juliet has said, and I think that we need a, a, a spectrum of interventions, and you know, starting from what you talked about, ICPC working with young people. I just have one concern and something for you to maybe come back upon later. Mm -hmm. That is, how has the ICPC monitored mm -hmm. the effectiveness mm -hmm. of the work that they've been doing with the young people? Who are these young people? We have Hush Puppy. I mean, I, I never knew there was something called Hush Puppy uh, uh, until the person was picked up. And my nieces and nephews mm -hmm. were like, you don't know, I don't do social media, so I have no clue what that is. But then if we have hush puppy and ICPC comes up and says, oh, we have all of these interventions we're doing with young people, how are they monitoring the effectiveness of their interventions? It's something I would, if there's anything out there, and the second thing to quickly drop is that, and you mentioned it as well, Juliet, which is the use of technology. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties, the, the, one of the greatest enablers of corruption in Nigeria is human interfaces with the different processes. And so, so we talk about the different agencies in the APAPA port, for example, 
mm. and and you have loads of congestion there and custom this one that one everybody and yet the, the, there's a major port in china that there is no human interface mm -hmm. it is it is everything is uh, is is um, based on technology uh oh okay raf raf is ready sorry i can't pronounce your full name raf so 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 we need to think about that and so how can we then take out the human interfaces to to these processes Palavi, please sorry. yes absolutely thank you mr rafsanjani and it is absolutely fantastic to have you on board i think uh You've come in at just the right point of uh, intervention. I'm just going to do a quick introduction uh, of your of you to the audience, the, uh, just just so that we, uh, you know, everybody's on the same page. Mr. Rafsanjani, as I began with, is executive director uh, of the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, CISLAC, which all of us recognize as one of the foremost civil society bodies working on freedom of expression, citizens' rights. That's you know, these are uh, all causes that Mr. Rafsanjani actually champions. Uh, he is um, head of Transparency International Nigeria. Uh, so we do a lot of work with Transparency International in Bangladesh. So it's absolutely a pleasure to have somebody from Transparency International Nigeria uh, talking to us here. And he's also board of trustees chairman Amnesty International. So I uh, will leave the floor to you now, Mr. Rafsanjani. I, I, I think uh, since we've talked so much about prevention and a lot of the questions here are on prevention, and getting the right messaging out and whether we, we have the right kind of ethics, your insight on how civil society can actually help create a more robust and effective EFCC would be absolutely fantastic here. Over to you, sir. Can you hear us? Because we know that he's been, he's been waiting to come on for a bit. I just hope that his technical issues have been sorted. If, if, there's, if there's a problem, if there's a problem, Mr. Rafsanjani, will you just drop us a chat, a chat message, and then, then we'll know? Or if you could get in touch with uh, our colleague, Jeremy at CBD. We'll know one way or the other. Sorry, Emilia, you were saying something. Is it okay for, for Juliet to, to deal with those two issues that I had raised? And so one is how, uh, how does um, ICPC measure? So how do they measure the effectiveness mm -hmm. of the work they're doing with citizens to know whether it is effective with young people and if it is not, you know, to re-strategize. And well, then yeah. Sorry, second. And then the second one is on the use of technology and taking out the human interfaces with yeah. the processes. Yes, thank you, Emilia. Uh, first of all, I'm not able to speak uh, about uh, ICPC's measurement framework or monitoring and evaluation framework. Um, and I, I, I hope that some of the civil society organizations in this um, uh, webinar can speak to that, uh, certainly, uh, whether they've been able to reach out to the, uh, the at least we would say the, the, the number of youth that could make a difference is something that uh, is very critical, is very important, and it's important that they measure effectiveness. Secondly is uh, the question about technology. <clears throat> the technology framework that has been established today uh, lies, I mean, the, the FIU has been given quite what I would say extensive mandate in that regard, which is to ensure that at the back end, they have enough capability to trace uh, funds that could be com considered illicit because they are linked to um, public sector funds or because they are linked to um, corruption or because they are linked to terrorist financing, any type of crime you can imagine. And so but the, but the ability to move this information out very quickly to the people that we use it is also very important. So how do we make sure that when the intelligence is already there, that law enforcement gets this intelligence very quickly? 
I do not think that we lack the technology tools. I just think that we need to make sure it becomes efficient and that is effectively it's very utilized. Good right. Right. And that is effectively utilized in a manner that becomes effective and prevents the, the exactly the crime. Because if, by the time the crime is committed, it's difficult to trace. Uh, maybe because those assets already left the country or they are too hidden and we cannot find them. So the most important thing is to use those tools to identify the, those assets before they leave or, become, or before they become too hidden for anybody to trace them. So the tools, the effective tool, the most effective one, first of all, is the FIU, being able to use its capacity to bring together all those financial intelligence and move it to law enforcement at different levels. Yeah. I think we have Mr. Ra Rafsanjani. We do have Mr. Rafsanjani, absolutely. There are two questions from Martha and Sangeeta for Juliet and Emilia, but we'll come back to them after Mr. Rafsanjani has made his intervention. Uh, Mr. Rafsanjani, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, I was getting agitated that um, I've been on this for one hour and <laughs> and I'm not yet uh, been able to join, you know, but um, uh, thank you for this opportunity to actually share my perspective and also to see how we can sustain this kind of conversation. Because if we want to make the EFCC and anti-corruption generally effective and efficient, and also take away all the, um, the concern that some Nigerians are having on the operation of the various anti-corruption in Nigeria, we need this kind of dialogue. We need this kind of conversation. As we all know, uh, before the establishment of the EFCC, Nigeria was um, one country that was seen like outcast, you know, in you know, in the world. Our image and our reputation was really terrible. Until one EFCC came on board to deal with you know fundamental you know um, issues of corruption, like um, uh, dealing with the uh, the four nine, you know, which is uh, one of the major issue at the time, you know, before the EFCC came on board. And since the EFCC came on board, we have seen how politically exposed person you know, have also been, uh, cases also been addressed. And we have also seen how high profile cases of corruption, grand corruption has also, you know, um, been, you know, uh, addressed. I think, you know, um, you know, recently the cyber crime, you know, uh, has been one prominent, you know, um, corruption that has been going on, which EFCC has been really dealing with. So all I'm trying to say is that um, when you look back before the, coming of EFCC and what you see today, you will see there's a lot of tremendous you know, improvement. However, uh, we need to do more. And from the civil society perspective, there are a number of issues that we you know, think that EFCC need to do in order to you know, sustain the success that it has actually um, recorded. One of it is to continue to engage in public you know, engagement uh, with both the civil society and the media to also remove so many you know, misconception and perception uh, that probably the agency is doing the bidding of you know, uh, somebody. I think with such kind of robust engagement, a lot of Nigerians will change their mindset about what they perceive EFCC to be. Of course, the corrupt people, they will always do everything possible to make sure that they undermine the effectiveness of the EFCC. I think it is also important that you know, um, EFCC uh, strive to ensure that there's a balance in the uh, investigation and prosecution of cases, so that we don't always, you know, you know, um, go without thorough investigation of cases. At the end of the day, the case will be thrown out. You know, um, I think it is also very fundamental that the EFCC continue to ensure that um, uh, it improves its synergy between the other anti-corruption agencies, so that there will not be too much duplication of uh, effort and energy and resources. I think it is very important that um, as we are trying to see how EFCC can be more effective and more efficient, the commission should actually increase its international cooperation with you know, uh, external partners. I know that um, at the level of uh, Transparency International, you know, um, we have always you know, um, tried to support the work of the EFCC at international level in especially with regard to the assets recovery, which Julia talks about. I think, you know, um, CISLAC, which is the Transparency International in Nigeria, has been very, very supportive in terms of providing credible information uh, and data to Nigerian government in terms of the uh, assets recovery and even the illicit financial 
you know, uh, flow. The money laundering that has been going on, you know, um, both in Nigeria continue to lose an estimated over 18 billion US dollars annually. Civil society are actually supporting government with credible information both at home and abroad. And I think it is important that anti-corruption agencies like EFCC begin to intensify that partnership and collaboration with the civil society, especially at the international level where access you know, um, recovery is going on. You are very much aware about the case, this um, PINID uh, case where Nigeria is being swindled with a lot of you know, um, uh, possible money that would have been used to development you know, in Nigeria. CISLA had published extensive report about that you know, through Transparency International to aid Nigerian government to ensure that that kind of uh, fraud of um, siphoning public taxpayers money you know, does not happen. So all I'm trying to say that international cooperation and collaboration is very key for the success of the EFCC, as well as also even domestic you know, um, collaboration with the partners, with different civil society organizations that are focusing on the fight against corruption. I think it is important that the EFCC you know, also uh, do everything possible to stay away from anything that will give impression that it is being politically guarded. <laughs> Because if you do that, you may lose the credibility and the public confidence, you know. But so far, so good, you know, especially, you know, um, with the recent intervention that the new chair of the EFCC is doing, which we are certainly supporting him. Cracking on the financial corruption within the financial, within the banking sector is a very key, important, you know, um, development that we are seeing. But more importantly, let me also state that the issues of the assets recovery, especially domestic, you know, um, asset. I think we need to be more, you know, transparent in the way and manner in which it is also uh, being handled. The absence of, you know, well legal framework, you know, that will manage and coordinate the recovered asset is still very, you know, um, a very, very, very concerned for Ross because you cannot be recovering and there's no any tangible evidence on how it has been you know, properly utilized. The domestic asset that have been recovered is more than even the you know, external asset that we have had. So I think it is important. While I, I, I appreciate the policy that um, or the um, guideline that Julia talked about in terms of the asset recovery that is domiciled within the Ministry of Justice, but I think we need to have more public engagement so that let Nigerians know what has been recovered and what has been utilized for. That will give more confidence on Nigerians, you know, on the effort that the ministry is doing, as well as the other anti-corruption agencies. I think it is important that this competitive, you know, uh, um, thing that we see with some anti-corruption agencies, we should turn it into a positive thing, rather than just trying to be, you know, seen as the one that you are doing X, Y, Z. We need to have coordination. We need to have cooperation within among them, like I mentioned. You know, if we do that, we can have very effective and efficient, you know, um, uh, fight against corruption, which EFCC actually has, you know, uh, over the years helped to even restore some dignity for Nigeria. Because, like I said in the past, really, once your passport is showing Nigeria, you are already a suspect, you know, in various international um, borders, whether it's uh, airport, whether it is seaport, or even land border. But with the coming of EFCC, coming to sanitize, you know, uh, various um, high profile, you know, 419 cases, I think it has dramatically helped to restore our dignity. And I think we must support EFCC to continue with that. So we are determined as civil society to support the sincere effort of the anti corruption agencies to ensure that, you know, Nigeria actually, you know, um, deals squarely with the issues of uh, corruption. But more importantly, sanction. We cannot just you know, allow some untouchable people to be doing what they are doing, and then you know, um, you know, you are, you know, so quick to deal with those poor, you know, um, people that are doing cyber crime. They are equally criminals, and those other ones that are doing grand corruption, they must also be brought to book. We don't need to waste too much time, but to be able to do that, EFCC also required. Um, more resources to deal with, you know, many of the uh, cases that it has before it. If you don't have enabling resources, you cannot be able to compete with this high-level 
in a politically exposed person who have stolen public money and using it to hire the best lawyer. EFCC must have you know, um, good teams of lawyers that before they even go to court, they must thoroughly you know, interrogate the case before they even go to file and so that they then go and file and then these high profile criminals will now use expert lawyers to go and uh, squat you know, um, the case in the court. I think it is very, very important that due diligence is done before you go to file case in the court. Lastly, uh, before you know, uh, I, I allow other people to you know to talk or to ask questions, is to say that look, we have been talking this over time and time that the way a manner in which even the selection or the recruitment of the you know um, staff. <laughs> It either EFCC, ICPC, police, and all the you know security agencies, you know, the way it is done, it is not going to help fight against corruption and also it will not help fight the insecurity in the country. Because when you do not do diligence on a, somebody that you are recruiting, and probably the person actually paid, because the truth is that to get a job in Nigeria now is for sale. If you don't have money to buy a job, you cannot get any job. If your father is not a minister or a you know a senator or a house of rape or a director or connected with you know power that be, you can never get job until you buy. So they are selling this, and I'm urging on EFCC and ICBC to begin to search on those people who are actually selling job offer in various ministries and you know uh, prestata, as well as also possibly in the anti-corruption agencies, because like I said, everything now is for sale. And everybody knows, and people are pretending that everything is well. It's not well. So we need to also, you know, beam our satellite, you know, on those people that are actually doing this kind of criminality. And the process, they end up recruiting four or nine uh, agents of um, criminals, you know, to perpetuate themselves inside the anti-corruption agencies or inside the security sector. That is why we are failing in some instances in terms of even dealing with the criminalities and insecurity in the country because the people you are recruiting, some of them you have not done background check to ensure that they are not connected with those criminals outside there. Likewise too, if you are recruiting within the anti-corruption agencies, let it be transparent. Let it be that you have done a thorough investigation on anybody that is going to be recruited in the anti-corruption agency because it requires people with high level of integrity and moral you know, um, prudence. Otherwise, if you go just because somebody is connected a note was given to you know employ him or her. I am telling you, you will be frustrating even the effort that you are supposed to be making. So I want to appeal to uh, the EFCC and ICPC to begin to deal squarely with those you know irresponsible people within the um, government that are selling job offer, which end up you know um, in the hands of criminals and poor niners to come and serve in a very sensitive agencies like you know um, anti-corruption agencies or even the security agents you know agencies with this i want to say that civil society is certainly behind a, an effective and efficient transparent open patriotic anti-corruption agency like efcc and we also want to you know uh, request that efcc try every possible everything possible to depoliticize its activities so that people will have faith and confidence in the operation that they are doing. I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rafsanjani. I think you've, you've touched on uh, some of the points that, that both uh, Juliet and uh, uh, Emilia were, were talking to in terms of what prevention means. And, and therefore, you brought to the civil society perspective of what that, what that uh, how civil society can actually prevent uh, a lot of uh, uh, the, the distortions that we see in the FCC. I think what I'm going to do, we, we had till, or we have till one o'clock, uh, we are running out of some time. So what I will do, and because this is a, a discussion on corruption in Nigeria, the chat box has just exploded with some of the most fantastic questions, uh, I have to say, and I won't unfortunately have the time, but what I will do, I've picked up the essence of most of, of, of the few sort of uh, trends, oh, we, we've lost Mr. Rafsanjani again, but he, he can come back, uh, the trends that, that seem to be appearing through the chat box, and I'll, I'll quickly go through them. Prevention, everybody's very worried about it whether information sharing and transparency can prove one way of preventing and, and, and uh, ensuring accountability, 
how do how do we reduce political interference? I think all of us, it's something that, that I began with in the beginning. Uh, we, we know that there is political interference. We know that the rules don't match up, but how do we reduce political interference? And then finally do this, because we are a very practical research program and we, we'd like some practical takeaways from this. Within this whole set of so-called adverse context, so difficult context, what are feasible reforms? What really could be feasible reforms when we know that this is how the EFCC is working and this is how the EFCC is working is constrained? So those are the four things, prevention, information sharing and transparency, how do you reduce political interference and, and what feasible reforms might be in this context? And I'm, I'm gonna throw this one last question as you know, wearing a moderator's hat because this is, this is also a, a, a personal matter of curiosity and would be useful for all others listening and not just for the EFCC. Technology has recently become this, you know, a magic bullet. You know, you, you, you use digitization, you, you digitize data, you make everything open and, you know, open access and on a platform, ergo corruption disappears without forgetting that there are, there is corruption at the very structural level before you can even digitize the platform, the corruption has happened. So where does the where do the panelists see this as, as interacting with, we can actually reduce corruption with data transparency and more digitization. So maybe Juliet, you can begin, begin here and I'm conscious of time. Maybe we can each have just, you can each have five to six minutes to, to round up. Juliet, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rafs and Jenny. Um, I think one of the things I said earlier is that we also uh, need civil society organizations to do a lot more work in terms of um, sharing as much as you can, but also uh, in terms of making sure those information actually get, when you have it, that it goes to the public, uh, more of the public, because the anti-corruption agencies are also limited in their ability uh, to share information. But in information sharing is very critical. And that is why we started the Open Government Partnership where civil society are co-equal partners in that process. And part of that process is that there is a co-chair who is a civil society person or private sector person, and there is also a government person. And within the Nigerian National Action Plan on Open Government, there is, um, I think, emphasis on data data, open budget data, open contracting data, as well as even within the asset recovery remit, there is an emphasis on making sure that there is asset transparency in asset recovery information. I, I, I can almost say, yes, we need more information, especially from the domestic side. And when I say domestic, I mean all the assets recovered in country, which is maybe recovered from EFC, by EFCC, ICPC, the police, the SS. Because when we did a mapping of all the agencies that have the power to recover assets, uh, about six agencies have that responsibility. And so what the regulation on asset management has done, asset recovery and management has done, is to get all these agencies to try to begin to put this information into the uh, newly created unit under the Federal Ministry of Justice. Uh, and I saw a comment there that they um, that people are not able to assess the link. I think that link has uh, the public interface and the private interface. I, I think I'll, I mean, I'll, I'm going to speak to the IT in the Federal Ministry of Justice and find out why the public interface is not accessible because it should be accessible. I've also said that when you go to the justice.gov.ng website, you will see everything about the internationally recovered assets. And I really call on uh, civil society to interrogate that as well. In fact, the civil society organizations that have been involved in monitoring the ANICH and now uh, Clean Foundation, are also, I know that ANICH has a website where they also provide information on their, you know, how they are monitoring assets. But I also know that Clean Foundation is now about to set up their website on how they are monitoring the three, uh, $311 million uh, recovered assets around, uh, which is currently being used on projects infrastructure, uh, working closely with the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority. So these are the two pillars. But domestic, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and I agree with uh, Rafsin Jani, and I think there is an, a need for more engagement on that aspect. And that is why we are so the process of crime bill, which is again, 
supposed to help in ensuring greater transparency the, around those recovered assets. Political interference is something that is so, you know, uh, we have political will and political interference. It's very amorphous. And you know, you and I know uh, that um, we've talked about African countries, but even within countries in the North, we know that it is almost impossible to have an institution live outside its political creation. The creation of all of these agencies are a function of political discourse. And so what we need to then do is to say, does the law enable, uh, what I would say, protection? Uh, what does the law do? How does the law function? But what about the people who are within this organization? Are they able to insulate themselves once they have the capacity to do so? Because there, there are two elements to political discourse when it comes to creation of institution. Once an institution is created and there is an appointment, the next level is for you to be able to move on with the, the capacity established within the law and then to move within the political discourse. I can almost tell you that it's impossible to insulate completely, but you can try to insulate your operations and insulate the, the, the outcome it is very challenging, even in the US where you have the FBI and Department of Justice, even where you in the UK where you have the National Crime Agency and all of that. But one thing that can be insulated is the operational capacity of those agencies. When an agency establish its capacity operationally, I can almost tell you that the insulation becomes more easy. But, but it's, it's not for me to say, okay, uh, there will not be political interference because, like I said, every institution is a creation of a political discourse. Institutions are created either under the constitution or created by the law through a political discussion of the National Assembly. But certainly the mandates, once there is a mandate, if we can just focus on those mandates and try to work within that mandate, I think we can have a successful story to tell. And I think we need to interrogate whether the operational capacity has been, as established under the law, have been fully utilized. When we interrogate it, because we are looking at investigation numbers, we're talking about prosecution numbers, we're talking about the outcome of asset recovery. We need to go through that process, maybe have a yearly, an annual evaluation. And Ralph, I'm talking to you here because you see, there's one thing about, so the agency can do its own report that we used to do shadow reports, right? Let's the CSO begin to look at shadow reports for the institutions where they can see, okay, you told us you did investigation of 100 cases, but now you have an outcome of 1,000, sorry, maybe one case that has managed to go to court. Why is that the case? So there's a lot of interrogation that needs to happen, but also there's a lot of internal uh, discourse that needs to be had. Uh, in terms of the operational capacity. Um, so I think I'll leave it here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. That wasn't you know, easy for you, I'm sure, to keep to six minutes. Mr. Rafsantani, if I might uh, uh, invite you now to respond to what Juliet says and, and those four points, especially in terms of, you know, I couldn't agree with Juliet more, political influence, whether it's interference or influence, is rife in any national agency, whether it's in, in the Global North or the Global South, being set up. So then how does civil society come in whether to act as a pressure point, whether to mobilize and make it feasible for that particular agency to reform within that context, within that particular political context. Well, that would be absolutely fantastic if you could offer us your views. Mr. Rafsanjani, could you get that? Yeah, sorry, can you repeat the question? I just got, I didn't hear you. No worries, I'm, I'm very happy to repeat it. I think that there was just a bit of a technical glitch there. So uh, okay. I, you, you did get most of what Juliet said, and I think she reached out to you in terms of how uh, uh, civil society organizations can act as pressure points and, and can act as uh, accountability mechanisms. And I said, uh, I completely agree with Juliet because wherever, whether it's the global north or the south, any institution and agency, especially anti-corruption and crime agencies are set up with a political narrative and a political will behind it. What matters is the outcome at the end of it. 
So in our context, in developing country context, how does civil society ensure that within this particularly difficult context, civil society can actually act as that accountability mechanism feasibly? All right, thank you very much. I think the, uh, one of the ways in which you can actually um, guarantee the non-political you know, interference of um, EFCC or an anti-corruption agent is of course, you know, from even the very law that you know it created, you know, um, the, the the operation and the activities, you know, of that commission. You know, uh, one of the things that we have observed is that there's a lacuna even in the setting up of the board that will oversight the EFCC itself. For example, um, you have various, um, you know, government agencies that are supposed to actually even be themselves monitored, uh, mm -hmm. populated, you know, uh, as uh, part of the board in the EFCC, which I think they need to bring in non-state actors from, you know, uh, from as member in that, in that commission, so that at least the non-state actors will be able to point out certain you know, abnormalities or certain irregularities or certain things that will make the commission lose its you know, credibility or, uh, or its independence. I see that there's absence of that you know, um, in, you know, in, in what we have now. Secondly, I think there's too much of a, you know, dramatization of the, you know, um, anti-corruption and its leadership, you know, generally in Nigeria. I've been to many countries. When you see the head of anti-corruption agency, it's not, you know, being seen like a, a president of the country. But in the case of Nigeria, the office and the uh, leadership of that place is as good as a president of a country. I think we need to, you know, the politicize and de expose the you know, commission to look as if it is um, one agency that is um, uh, above anything. You know? I think it is important that we do something that has to do with amending the act itself. Again, I think it is important that you know, there are certain comments, there are certain statements that you know, uh, should not be coming from the anti-corruption agency like uh, EFCC. Let them stay away, you know, from anything that is political. We have a minister of information in Nigeria. You have the spokesperson of the president. If there are things that are political, the EFCC or ICPC should not be seen to be engaging in that. You know, why I'm saying this thing is important because the EFCC is supposed to be a technical, you know, um, commission, not a political commission. So any statement that will create some you know um political uh, turning efcc should actually you know um ascertain itself let them do the work more and stop you know um talk anti-corruption should not be seen talking they should be seen doing the work actually you know if they do that i think you know uh, many nigerians would have seen that they are actually doing a lot without them you know talking like uh you know um you know maybe as if uh, like uh one government, you know, uh, propaganda um, um, uh, agent. They should be technical. They should, they should, they should de emphasize about, you know, anything that will make their statement or their utterances to look too political. Let the government spokesperson talk on issues that has to do with the government politics, you know. But there should not be anything that will create, you know, uh, a feeling that uh, even the opposition political parties will be thinking that, uh, you know, the anti-corruption agencies is meant to was want them. No, I think we should encourage EFCC to operate in an equal um, manner, whether you are PDP, or APC, whatever you know, um, you know, party you belong to, whatever region, whatever religion, whatever ethnic, you know, um, or tribal you know, um, group you come from, if you commit crime, let EFCC investigate and take you know, you know, um, decisive action so that it will serve as a deterrent. But if because you are close to power, you are close to ruling party, you will commit X, Y, Z, and they, they, they will be absent or they will be silent you know, uh, on that. That will also continue to give people the impression that there's a politics behind the scene. Again, it is important that EFCC, like I mentioned, you know, intensify its public engagement with the civil society, with the media, and the general public. I think EFCC should spend some time doing public education because a lot of Nigerians, there's so much ignorance about certain things they commit, which they actually, they may not know the gravity or the 
extent at which they are committing crime. But if there's a political education, you know, sensitization as a core activities of the EFCC, we will have prevented so many cases and EFCC will not be wasting its too much time on, you know, um, pursuing so many cases, so many uh, things because already, you know, public education and enlightenment have reached a state that if you do the same thing, it means that you are actually a criminal or you are interested in engaging, you know, in the crime. So you can actually be, you know, um, dealt with. But I think there's need to emphasize more in public education. I can tell you that, you know, um, once you are able to do that, so many efforts and energy that has been, you know, uh, put by EFCC in pursuing cases, legal cases and what have you will have been dramatically reduced. Again, let EFCC also, any National Assembly member, any minister, anybody that is related to a governor, if your wife is involved in anything that is, um, uh, you know, um, uh, against the law, because you are a minister wife, because you are a governor wife, because you are a president or vice president or deputy governor, anybody that does anything, EFCC should not shy away from, you know, carrying out its mandate. Nothing will happen to them. Civil society and Nigerian people, if they see that they are actually doing this thing genuinely, they will support them and no powerful minister or governor or any political class, you know, will do anything against them. We will support them. We will continue to provide, you know, uh, all the necessary, you know, contact even abroad to be able to do their work. We are doing this and we will continue to do that and we will continue to propagate the effort that anti-corruption agencies are making in order to reduce crime and in order to reduce, you know, um, financial crime in Nigeria. We need EFCC to continue to do the good work that is doing, but we need to do it in a manner that is also within the confines of law you know, uh, in, you know, in, in Nigeria. Thank you. For sure, for sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Rafsanjani. Emilia, you have the next five, six minutes. Floor is yours. What does feasible and effective look like in this context? Uh, thank you very much, Palavi. I think I I'd like to just sort of take us back to where we started and go back to uh, our working paper and the constraints that we recognized and we found from our research on the effectiveness of the EFCC. So we talked about political capture and Juliet and Raf, is it okay for me to call you Raf? Uh, and Raf have, have really focused on that and they've said a lot. We talked about organizational deficiencies. They've also engaged with that. I, I want to pick up on that and the judicial process. On organizational efficient, uh, deficiencies, I'd just like to add a few things uh, to what we have already heard, or again, substantiate some of those. Uh, I, for me, I think that there is a great need for qualitative staffing, qualitative staffing. Uh, we have so many very well-educated Nigerians across the world I sort of say to myself that I'm sure you'd have a colony of Nigerians in North Korea or, so, or Siberia or somewhere. You know, we, we have capacity, human capacity, especially with our young people who at least have not sort of acquired certain tastes that need uh, the, and have um, uh, relevant knowledge. I think that we need to think of qualitative uh, staffing and, and personnel for, for the EFCC. I think that the EFCC itself, as I mentioned, had identified in their annual reports, the need for continuous training for in any area of life, in any sphere of life, continuous training is important. Um, we've already engaged with various ideas on how the EFCC can become independent from the political class. I hear all that um, Raj has said and, and the passion with which he has spoken. But um, let's recognize that somebody had said something in the chat about the polity, the citizens themselves. And so if my own senator or my own minister, in the sense the minister comes from my part of the country, is caught with their hand in, in, in the cookie jar, and I stand up and say, 
why should my minister be prosecuted? Is it only my minister that has been caught with her hand, his or her hand, before I give away who I'm talking about, his or her hand in the cookie jar? There is a huge problem. There is a massive problem because that narrative is also saying something to the politically exposed persons, to the politicians. We're saying we, the rude, are saying something to them. So I think that that's something that um, we need to pick up, uh, maybe uh, Palavi with some more work uh, from what Raj ha has said. And, and somebody else said something in the chat about uh, when you move to a political, the ruling political party, all your past sins, I think that's the way Nigerians say it, all your past sins are forgotten. Um, maybe by the APC, but not necessarily by God or the community or the people whose monies have been stolen or the woman whose child has died from diarrhea or some, some or, or polio or some, some uh, uh, health condition that can easily be dealt with. And I think that is hugely important because if a political party is the ruling political party and is saying that we accept and people flock to that political party, to, uh, to evade or avoid persecution, there is a huge problem. And I think that uh, that has already been picked up upon. In the paper, we talk about the tenure of the, uh, the chairman of the EFCC. I think I'd like to add the tenure of the chairman and secretary of the EFCC. So whoever is the top power base people within the EFCC, in the paper, we talk about their tenure straddling to um, uh, election periods or to um, uh, presidential uh, periods. But again, the way Nigeria operates, I think we had the PDP for 16 or so years. Looks like we might end up with the APC for another 16 or so years. So maybe that's something to think about, but maybe the tenure, maybe a single six year term with that is properly remunerated and it's not renewable. And so, so, so that, that's something that we talk about. And the, the need for security of tenure is massively important and adequate remuneration for staff and training and all of that. And we also picked up on better coordination. You know, we've already talked a lot about within, uh, among the ACAs and their international counterpart. That uh, there's the need for clarity of the scope of the mandate of each of these, and uh, because there's a lot of overlap and there's been some questions on uh, agencies not wanting to share space, agencies not wanting to share information because they're trying to protect their own turf. What it therefore means is that the various agencies have not bought into that primary goal and that primary uh, uh, end point where we are, the objective that we want to achieve. And so there's need for that. And then there is uh, on information and data. I think what we need is qualitative uh, and Palavi, I'll be grateful if you can put that in your list. The provision of qualitative, not, not rubbish data, not, not just saying, oh, you had this and then you prosecuted. And we don't know why did you not pursue this and those sorts of things. I hear what Juliet says, which is that, you know, the, uh, the um, people like Mr. Uh, Raj should be the ones, you know, uh, producing shadow reports to query and question. Uh, I'm sorry, but one of the things we, I think we are all very much conversant is that the average Nigerian does not read much. They, can, they will read their newspapers, they would read their social media and all of that, but to pick up a working paper or to pick up a report and read it and unpack it and actually publish something around it, it's just those who are particularly interested uh, and professionals in those areas that deal with that. And so I think we need to think about it and how we can work with that and what needs to be on the pages of newspapers. 
uh, and that would lead to what um, all the panelists have already said about verifiable data, verifiable, because we found it really difficult to, to, to find uh, data that we can actually rely, rely upon. I think those are the things I would like to add on to what has already been said. Palavi. Thank you for those excellent interventions. And you know, this is Nigeria, we're talking about the FCC. The conversation has been animated, has been passionate, has been committed. Uh, obviously the FCC still means a lot to citizens in Nigeria. I think studying uh, an anti-corruption agency like the EFCC can also be helpful for other anti-corruption agencies across the African uh, continent and, and indeed in, in Asian developing context. So uh, it's been wonderful to see some of the points that have come up. And uh, you know, at, at the risk of even contradicting myself in some of the earlier work that I have done, uh, where I've said information or, or data does not always solve problems, I think the issue here in Nigeria and, and with the EFCC and, and essentially data on what anti-corruption means, when the baseline is low and you're actually creating a baseline, and I think that's where we are in Nigeria, in Nigeria right now, we're in the process of creating that information and data baseline. Anything that we can add, and here civil society has a huge role to play, anything that we can add to creating that baseline will be extremely helpful. Beyond that, it becomes a more difficult issue, but I think we need to even create that baseline in Nigeria, which, which hasn't been happening, but Nigeria has an extremely uh, active and, and vibrant civil society space yeah. where you know, that can happen. Extremely committed civil servants also. So things that came up, information sharing and education for prevention, coordination among the anti-corruption agencies. I mean, Tugar took off, nothing much happened, nothing much came out of it, but is it worth resurrecting a version of Tuga, at least thinking about it in policy spaces to bring the 27 ACAs together in some shape or form. Uh, financial independence and upgrading of capabilities across the anti-corruption agencies, that's extremely important. Behavioral dimensions and culture, that, that came up. Recruitment into civil services uh, uh, being a problem. So we do have a sort of smorgasbord of, of issues and concerns here. And I think some of the conversations in the chat Obviously, some, all your interventions show that there are feasible uh, interventions possible, uh, incremental in interventions. I think we should be mindful of the fact that political big bang reforms won't happen. We can't destroy the system and, and, and move forward, and we don't want that. That's not feasible. We have a structure, we have a system, and that system and structure provides us the space with which to change it. Nothing's, uh, or, you know, it's not lost and it's not a given that nothing can change. We need to create the pressure points. We need to create the opportunities. Juliet, Emilia, and uh, uh, Awal have, have spoken passionately about what that could be. All of you have had ideas there. We will keep this engagement going. I want to thank the panelists for their time. It's been a long two hours, but it's been a very interesting uh, two hours. Sorry for the 10 minute delay to all of you who've been waiting patiently, but I think it's been well worth it. I have a lovely evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you are and wherever you're signed in. We will keep the conversation going. Thank you again.